the neuroscience behind language learning. David Grossman in The Cost of Poor Communication mentions that a company loses an estimated $62 million per year because of inadequate communication between employees. If an employee has poor communication skills, it can impact workplace productivity in many ways. Poor communication can lead to miscommunication, which can lead to errors and rework. Additionally, poor communication can lead to conflict and tension among team members, which can decrease morale and motivation. Poor communication skills are a harsh reality despite the plethora of English language programs available for adults and an increasing adoption of English language in schools in non-English speaking countries. So where exactly is the learning gap? If the receiver does not comprehend what the speaker is saying, the communication is ineffective. The primary assumption made here is that the language used by the speaker and understood by the listener is one and the same. For further simplicity, English is presumed to be the language of communication because English is the most widely used and accepted language for business communication. Communication can be any form, email, letters, social media, and even verbal. When communicating with a broader audience, especially on social media, any errors can be misunderstood, amplified, and can cause harm to the speaker and even several others. Quantum jumps in learning outcomes are possible only if there is a paradigm shift from the current teacher-centric method to a learner-centric method of education. This helps each learner to pace his or her learning, which helps meet the ultimate learning goals. This is more sensible as reaching the learning goal is more important than dragging a cohort of learners at different achievement levels. So how do we do that? Let's have a look at experiential learning. Experiential learning is a process through which learners learn by doing. It's a hands-on approach that allows learners to learn on the job instead of listening to lectures in the classroom. So let's discuss a few advantages of experiential learning. Number one, active engagement. Experiential learning engages learning in active. Experiential learning engages learners in active participation and this increases their enthusiasm in learning. Improved retention. Learners tend to retain knowledge better when they experience it directly rather than just hearing or reading about it. Number three, real world application. Experiential learning allows learners to apply what they have learned to real world situations, which enhances their understanding and skills. Next, increased creativity. By engaging in experiential learning, learners are encouraged to think creatively and solve problems in innovative ways. Experiential learning often involves group work, which promotes collaborative learning and helps learners develop communication as well as team working skills. Next, we have emotional engagement. So experiential learning can create an emotional connection with the subject matter, making it more memorable and meaningful. Experiential learning can be tailored to the learner's interest styles, making it a more personalized and more effective way of learning. So who is the brain behind experiential learning? The brain is behind experiential learning. Yes, that's the answer. Muscular memory is the brain's ability to remember certain muscle movements. This allows people to perform tasks without having to think about them. How does a child who never forgets how to play cricket or ride a cycle forget mathematics in the class test? Did anyone know that the part of the brain that controls cycling is different from the one that tries to cram in the maths formulae? The human brain comprises of neurons that in simple terms transmit signals. Each neuron is connected to the other through a synapse. The strength and patterns of connection between neurons are thought to be key determinants of these cognitive functions. The cerebellum constitutes about 10% of the brain's weight, but it comprises of almost 50% of the total neurons in the brain. The procedural memory, known as the muscular memory, is controlled by the cerebellum and is a part of the subconscious or implicit memory and uses past experiences to handle the task at hand. Now you know how the child is able to remember cycling or riding a bike but forgets the math formula so easily. So cycling, driving and putting on shirt buttons happen unconsciously without much thought. It differs from declarative or explicit memory that requires conscious thought to recollect facts, events and happenings. Sports persons and musicians do better with time as they excel at the use of procedural memory 
to master the skills that they need. So what's the correlation between neurons and language learning? Neuroscience and language learning is the study of how the brain processes and acquires language. This can encompass anything from how infants learn their first words to how adults learn a second language. Researchers in this field use a variety of techniques including brain imaging to try and understand how the brain learns a language. In recent years, neuroscience has made great strides in understanding the brain and the underlying language learning capabilities. For example, research has shown that the brain regions responsible for processing language are different in bilinguals than in monolinguals. Overall, neuroscience in language learning is a rapidly growing field with many exciting discoveries yet to be made. There is some evidence that suggests that the structure and function of neurons may be related to language learning. For example, studies have found that people with more highly developed neurons in certain areas of the brain tend to be better at learning languages. However, it is not clear how strong this relationship is and more research is needed to determine how significant a role neuronal structure and function plays in language learning. Training the brain to learn a new language is one of the most important aspects of neuroscience in language learning. This includes understanding how the brain recognizes words and how it produces speech. Researchers are also interested in how the brain acquires grammar and how different languages are processed in the brain. The muscular memory has a key role to play in language development too as it allows us to talk seamlessly without thinking of syntax and grammar. The brain is very efficient at learning new languages. However, there are some things that can help make the process easier and more effective. Identifying a learning method that suits your preferences is crucial. Whether you prefer auditory cues, textual materials or classroom instruction, select the approach that facilitates optimal learning for you and maintain it. Regularly practicing the language is vital in improving your comprehension and the ability to utilize it. The more frequently you engage with the language, the greater your proficiency will become. Total immersion in the language is essential for effective learning. This encompasses listening to, speaking, reading and writing the language as much as possible. Increased exposure to the language will expedite your brain's capacity to acquire it. So when is the right time to start? The right time to start is early childhood because early childhood is the best time for the brain to learn certain things. The brain is more malleable in early childhood, making it easier for young children to learn new concepts and skills. This is why early childhood education is so important. Children who receive quality training during their early years are more likely to be successful in building proficiency in the language. Also, research has shown that infants have a neural predisposition for language learning which helps explain why they can learn languages so easily. Contrary to popular perception, the child's brain has a denser network of neurons and synapses as compared to that of an adult. The brain can adapt to different language environments. The brain has an ability to prune inactive synaptic connections with age and therefore the adult brain has a far thinner density of synaptic connections, although a stronger network of the remnants. Learning as adults when brain is not flexible is comparatively difficult, although not impossible. It is still possible to learn a new language with some additional effort, even if you're an adult. So, a child aged four to six years would have approximately 100 billion to 120 billion neurons and about 15,000 synapses per neuron, giving about 1,500 trillion synaptic connections. The retention or destruction of the synaptic connections until adulthood depends on the child's learning experiences, usage, and so on. The brain strengthens networks that are used and prunes that remain unused despite aging. Eventually, an adult is left with about 80 billion to about 100 billion neurons and approximately 7,500 synapses per neuron or even lesser. Organized or systematic learning that takes place between the ages of two and six is referred to as early education. This education usually takes place in playgroup, nursery, junior or lower kg and so on. The importance of early education lies in the fact that the brain reaches its maximum development potential between the ages of 1 and 6 years. For healthy child development, it is crucial to focus not only on the physical growth but also on the development of emotional, behavioral, cognitive, 
language and general learning competencies the human brain experiences significant growth during this stage as children acquire and integrate skills across multiple areas so starting early is not an option it is a necessity it is pointless to pressurize children to magically become brilliant public speakers in high school or later the foundations must be laid in the golden years in preschool when the neural networks are highly elastic and ready to be molded spending lakhs of rupees on high profile coaching may be unnecessary if we spend quality time creating a joyful environment and impart quality education in the early years so here are a few pro tips to learn a new language one way to improve english language communication is to strengthen the neurons that are responsible for processing and understanding the language this can be done through activities that engage and stimulate the neurons such as reading listening to english conversation and writing in english additionally practicing english with a native speaker can also help to strengthen the neurons responsible for processing the language repetitive practice one way to improve communication skills is to repetitive practice this can involve repeating words and phrases aloud writing them down or reading them aloud next impromptu speaking impromptu speaking is a speech given without any time to prepare it happens in everyday situations like giving directions to a stranger and in formal situations like giving a toast at a wedding impromptu speaking can help you think on your feet and come up with ideas quickly reading some ways to improve vocabulary in english are to read books to look up words in the dictionary understand the meaning and pronunciation and use the new word in day to day conversations using the newly learned word multiple times ensures that the word is permanently imbibed in your memory next we have writing writing involves muscular memory particularly when learning how to form letters and words correctly writing frequently and learning from the experience will eventually reduce the margin of error what about loud reading loud reading can be an effective way to practice pronunciation and fluency some people might find that loud reading helps them to focus and pay attention to the text while others might find that it helps them to understand better and remember the information reading loudly can also help in improving speech hygiene so how should you go about it should you record an audio or a video a beginner struggling to put his thoughts together should initially practice recording audio clips once he or she develops enough confidence speaking seamlessly for 4 to 5 minutes he or she can occasionally switch over to video recording if you have a great coach the coach can spot the variation in performance between the two and will strive to close the gap over time while body language is the most common difference learners also tend to fumble more miss out on some points on video as compared to that when you are recording an audio clip structuring and articulating your thoughts is critical when one is presented with a question it is important to ensure that they have a clear understanding of what is being asked in cases of uncertainty about the question it is acceptable to request clarification taking a few moments to think about one's response is also vital even if a perfect answer is not readily available it is critical to have a general idea of the intended response once the thoughts are in order it's advisable to organize them in a clear manner to facilitate confident and swift communication practicing the answer aloud can help identify areas that require improvement and aid in smoother communication in conclusion the neuroscience behind language learning provides valuable insights into how our brains process and acquire new languages from understanding the role of hippocampus in memory formation to the plasticity of the brain researchers have made significant strides in uncovering the complex mechanisms underlying language learning with this knowledge educators and language learners can optimize their approaches and strategies to improve their language acquisition abilities as we continue to unravel the mysteries of the brain we can expect even more exciting discoveries that will enhance our understanding of how we learn and use language